Howdy, howdy, this is Mr. Potter. What we're going to talk about today, we're going to be starting our next unit, which is dealing with both networks, uh, networking, and the internet. And so I want to start with a brief history of the internet, and there's a lot of history that goes to the internet. Uh, a lot of this stuff actually goes back to the Advanced Research Projects Agency. This is a governmental agency in the United States that first brought together the idea of having a series of interconnected computers. The idea is that you would be able to have some computer being able to talk to some other computer uh, be it just you know 10 miles away or a thousand miles away through some type of medium and computers would be able to exchange data back and forth. Now this is an idea that they were working with from the late 1950s uh, through the 1960s and it finally came to fruition when some researchers in 1965 at MIT and the University of California at Santa Barbara uh, really put together the first connection between two computers. Now keep in mind you're talking about Massachusetts and California, so you're talking 3,000 miles away, so you have the computer in California uh, connected through a telephone cable to this computer over here. Uh, in Massachusetts being able to communicate back and forth um, and the idea that they used the telephone cable here because it was an existing medium that they could do uh, it wasn't until later on where they start to get to dedicated network cables not necessarily using telephone wires to get the signals across and this actually happened in 1969 uh, more on the West Coast. Uh, the first two computers that were connected to what we call the Internet today uh, was a computer at UCLA, University of California at Los Angeles, and at Stanford University, the Stanford Research Institute. And these were the first two nodes on the Internet, uh, the first two computers that actually connected with each other. Uh, using dedicated networking techniques. Uh, and there's a really interesting story about the first time that they wanted to allow this type of connection. Of course, you need a secure connection so they had to have a login. So they send the letter L across the network. And of course, they're on the telephone at the same time verifying that this information is being uh, received. So node number one sends the L, node number two receives the L. It's like, yes, we received the L. So now we're doing the O in login. They send the O, yes, they receive the O. And then the G in login, they send the G and the system crashes. Uh, of course, you know, this is a very experimental age. By the end of 1969, you're looking at four nodes on the internet, four computers that are pretty uh, well connected. You've got UCLA, uh, Stanford, uh, the aforementioned uh, Santa Barbara, and also University of Utah. And what you see here are the actual computers that were actually connected to the internet at that time. Uh, the PDP series of computers being one of the more prevalent ones that we'll see later on in our discussion. Of course, this network is going to grow as time goes on. So now you see UCLA, you see the Rand Corporation, Harvard, Burroughs, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Case Western Reserve, University of uh, of uh, Nebraska at Lincoln, MIT, Illinois. Uh, you can see how the connections are being done. You can also see which computers are connected. You see some of these universities actually have multiple uh, computers connected to the internet at the time. Uh, of course, this is called the ARPANET because of that advanced research projects uh, that we talked about at the beginning. And this is gonna continue to grow. So 1973, you see this dominated by two types of organizations. You're going to see uh, universities through this, and you're also going to see private research organizations, kind of like RAND. Um, you're also seeing some military in here as well, because they're going to be you know, taking care of uh, sending sensitive information now that we've got some level of security. Um, but you still see this is a pretty... Um, it's starting to get this idea of one main stretch, what we would call on the internet the backbone of the internet. And we're gonna see this referred a couple of more times. Uh, by the time we get to 1983, this is a more geographical map rather than just uh, uh, seeing the actual connections between computers. And you can see that you've got you know a heavy concentration on the West Coast because of technology. You have a heavy concentration on the East Coast. And then you have major research universities uh, in the heartland of the United States. Um, 1983 is also important because it really brought up the idea of transfer control protocol and the internet protocol. The transfer 
control protocol is the way that computers are actually able to communicate with each other. And the internet protocol is the idea of addressing so that each computer has an individual address that can be directly accessed. Uh, prior to this, if you were dealing with the older maps, you could only communicate with the computers that were immediately adjacent to you. And so you had to, uh, you had to arrange some sequence of hops in order to get to the computer that you wanted to reach. Now you could just use the direct address and if that computer was not the address, it would send it along all of its paths until it found the correct address. And of course what it's doing is it's sending packets of information through this transfer control protocol. Once these two computers have uh, contact established, then they can decide how they want to share the information. And that's what the transfer control protocol. Both of these are things we're going to talk about in a lot more detail later on in this course. But right now, just understand that this is how the internet works today, more than 30 years later. Um, so we are still using transfer control protocol and some version of internet protocol to this day. Um, we keep on going, and in 1989, we have Tim Berners-Lee, and this is over at CERN in Switzerland, and he invents the World Wide Web. Prior to this, we're only sending text, um, but Tim Berners-Lee invented something called the Hypertext Markup Language, or HTML. And this allowed us to not only have text, but also include other types of media. So now we can store uh, digital photos. Now we can store uh, audio data, video data. All of these things can now be stored on a static web page. And so this idea of having a whole bunch of computers that can immediately access the page data uh, allows us to now come up with this idea of the World Wide Web. So we have the IP concept that we were talking about from the 1983 slide, along with this idea of the World Wide Web that's really establishing the internet as we know it today. Um, it wasn't until 1993, though, that we actually come up with a web browser. So here we've got a picture of Mosaic, and Mosaic was actually done by the National Center for Supercuting Computing Applications at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, this is the predecessor for all the browsers that we currently use. Uh, 1993 was when Mosaic, and I remember when Netscape was a browser. This one's currently the Mozilla Firefox. So if you're familiar with Firefox, Netscape was the progenitor of that. Um, Internet Explorer was another big player in the late 90s. Um, and then Apple came up with Safari. And we have uh, Google's Chrome. Uh, Microsoft has come out with their new Edge browser. And there are lots of different browsers that are out there. Some deal solely for small networks, some deal with more protected networks, and some allow us to access all of the virtual World Wide Web that we have today. Uh, it wasn't until 1997 that you start seeing a lot more commercialization. Prior to this time, you're looking at uh, major research organizations uh, and universities that have access to the internet. Uh, but around 1997, you start seeing America Online being a big uh, player, uh, bringing on networks. You'll start seeing GeoCities. And that was nice to allow us to get, um, to get the internet uh, up where people could actually make web pages rather than just organizations being able to do it. Uh, you have Yahoo, uh, which was one of the first ideas to come up with a catalog of pages. Uh, this is still prior to search engines. It wasn't until much later on that you start getting uh, Alta Vista and Google and Bing and the other uh, pages we are. This is uh, known as the Web, web 1.0 time. The idea is that all of these web pages are static. We don't have things that change. And so a lot of the stuff that we see today on the web is more dynamic. People can change things on the fly. Uh, you see that whenever you uh, upload something to social media. You see this whenever you type in something on a bulletin board. Prior to this, this was all very static data. And this actually leads up to the internet bubble. Because it is so new, anything that has the word internet attached to it uh, is immediately seen as a financial gain, something that people can invest in. And 
without the ability to actually produce real products or real services for these people, uh, their investments often went for naught. Uh, there were a lot of companies that did not survive this period of the internet. Um, but a lot of these people who were involved with these companies were able to later on uh, go to the next stage and uh, really incorporate their knowledge into later versions of the internet. Uh, probably one of the most uh, seminal papers to come out of this uh, most recent part of the network is Vince Cerf's uh, document, The Internet is for Everyone. And what he does is this paper in 2002 is he talks about the current state of the web, the internet, networking in general, and then he talks about how to make sure that the internet truly can be for everyone. Keep in mind at this point that less than 20% of households had access to the internet on a regular basis. Uh, broadband certainly wasn't anything that existed in any real state with the exception of those aforementioned research universities and corporations uh, people had to dial up to a internet service provider in order to get internet access and so he talks about nine points in his paper one of the things he talks about is affordability in other words, uh, if the internet is not affordable then people aren't going to be able to use it. Uh, he also talks about restriction by governments. And so we're talking not only about restriction by governments through censorship, but we're also talking about uh, restriction by governments uh, through legislative means. So he talks about two, thing, two things here where the internet won't be available for everyone if these things happen. Um, we actually have to keep up with demand for services. And of course, lately you've seen, you know, streaming media be one of the big services that come up. And so, one, there have to be providers for streaming media, such as Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, etc. But there also has to be media that, there also has to be mediums for the transmission of that data. So if you're looking at your, your 4G or your 3G, how are you getting that information, broadband, whatever. Um, you need to talk about ubiquity. This internet that we're talking about is really the internet of things. So the thing is, it's not only the fact that you have a computer that's connected to the internet, but you have a TV that's connected to the internet so it can receive media. You have a telephone that's connected to the internet so you have accessibility for it wherever you go. There are people who attach their coffee makers to the internet, or they will attach their cars to the internet. So this idea of ubiquity where the internet is an all-engulfing, all-surrounding thing. We also need ease of use. And of course, when I talk about ease of use, back in the 2002, it was rather difficult for a person to actually get onto the internet, getting the networking equipment, getting the software that was necessary. Nowadays, it's just a push of a button. Um, there are other things that we have to take care of. So we've got these calls here, but we also have to deal with privacy. In other words, can you keep your information private? And this is actually one of the biggest issues today is how do I keep my information on my social media, on my website, uh, the information that I share with hospitals or schools or other organizations? How do I keep my data private and secure so it's not being sold for advertisement purposes, not being sold for uh, information harvesters or what have you? We also need to be able to provide protections not just to patients in a hospital, but also to our students on the internet so they're not exposed to inappropriate material. Uh, so that, you know, I'm not exposed to shocking videos uh, by news outlets that really want to uh, get my advertising buck. And then one other thing that we have to do is we have to be respectful of rights. And rights on several levels. Uh, for example, one of the big things that's coming up uh, currently is the idea of the right to be forgotten. The idea that if I commit a minor crime when I'm 17 or 18, yes, the court records may be sealed, but the web page uh, for the newspaper that reported that incident may have that information up searchable 10, 20, 30 years from now, and that could affect my ability to, to get a job, that might affect my uh, ability to run for political office. Uh, not only those rights, but also the rights of people to be able to say 
things that they want to say but also the right for people not to be hurt through hate speech or bullying and there's a lot of balance on this and although this paper was written in 2002 a lot of the stuff that's in this paper is still pertinent today more than 10 years later so this is a very important document we'll actually be reading parts of this in class um, we get to web 2.0 the idea of interactivity the idea that a user could type some information on a page and that becomes part of the page so this allows us to get to the idea of forms uh, forms that users could fill out and this really does get us to the idea where we are today the age of social media where students can put information out on the web, they can share information, they can post videos to YouTube like I've been doing for this whole course, uh, they can share pictures uh, using social media, uh, they can collaborate on documents, they can do all of these things, and we'll be talking about all of these aspects in more detail throughout this unit and the next unit. But it's really a good idea to understand where we've come from in this uh, idea as we've built up this internet and also to do like vent surf did and kind of figure out where do we want to head some of the things that we'll be talking about in this course is where do we want the next 10 years to go rather than just the previous 10 years because if you take a look at what's happened in the previous 10 years and how much you know we've seen youtube come up we've seen twitter come up we've seen facebook come up we've seen all of these different things that we see as an essential part of our life that have come up just in the past 10 years so that now they are they are a precious part of our life that we could not live without what's going to happen in the next 10 years and how are you going to be a part of building that so once again this is mr potter thank you for watching have a great day